right. Well, I think we should just make a start. And if there's any <laughs> other people joining, we can just add them in as we go. Um, so welcome to this Lothian's Women in Agriculture meeting. Um, this is the third and final meeting of the year. Um, hopefully, MG will be back and planning an in-person meeting in the spring if she's up for it. Um, so keep your eyes out for that. Um, today we have Jo McNichol from Drift Cafe talking to us and sharing her story and hopefully she will motivate and inspire you. Um, just a couple of housekeeping uh, bits before we start. Could you please keep yourself on mute when you're listening and it just saves um, any background noise. Um, but do feel free to unmute yourself to ask questions. Um, I'm sure we'd like a bit of chat at the end and it's much easier if you ask Jo your questions yourself. Um, after the meeting, there will be feedback forms emailed out to you. Um, please, could you fill them in? Um, it gives us feedback on what we can improve on. And if you fill in the form, you'll also be entered into a prize draw to win a £50 voucher from either Battlefield Bakery or Damn Delicious. Um, so it's worth doing. Um, and I think that's everything for me. So I'll hand you over to Jo. Joe, you're on mute. Uh, honestly, I've been doing this for over a year. You'd think I'd get the hang of it by now. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Can everybody see, hopefully in a second, that? I can see it. Perfect. Okay. So um, a quick run through of, of what I'm going to cover today. Um, basically largely revolving around our story, um, which doesn't just begin at Drift, it actually began um, quite some years before that with some other ideas. Um, but I'll, I'll quickly introduce who I am, where we are, um, those ideas leading to Drift, and then that part of the, the, our Drift journey. I'm going to touch a bit on lockdown because I think that that's been a challenging period of time, or is still a challenging period of time for a lot of us. And it's not all caviar and champagne, is it? It's um, it, it, it's quite good to talk about those challenges of, of which we've had a good number. Um, and, and then the ups and downs of 2021, um, which will also include how we're intending to move forward. Um, so um, my name is Joe McNichol and I am the co-owner and director of Drift. Um, I'm, I've put myself up obviously because I'm, I'm just introducing myself, but it is a team effort and I have to keep reminding myself of that. Um, for those of you that know Caroline Miller, who is the lead um, uh, for agritourism, um, I was on a call with her during lockdown and we were going over everything that um, I was doing or we, we were doing. And But at the end of my conversation with her, I was very conscious of the fact that I said, and I'm doing this and I'm doing that and this is what's happening. And and, and I've managed to instigate this. And, and she said, that's that's absolutely super, all really good. How's head of maintenance and gardens getting on? Um, so poor Stuart was then given this job title of head of maintenance and gardens. And of course, he does an awful lot um, more than that. Oh, that's funny. I've disappeared off. Um, he does an awful lot more than that. Um, he is a director in Drift, and um, he, but largely he does run the farm. So he manages our 200, uh, 430 acre farm. Um, a little bit of past um, information about him. He was also, and this is quite crucial actually to my presentation as I move forward with it. He was a past, uh, he is a past NFUS Lothian and Borders chair. Um, and he started out with the East Lothian branch and then he progressed on and chaired um, Lothian and Borders for three years. Um, so I spent many um, NFUS AGMs um, in St Andrews and then latterly in Glasgow um, with 500 far other farmers, um, which all coincided with our wedding anniversary, which was not good, don't advise that. Um, so... Um, so, but it's quite important because I always looked up to Stuart um, in terms of everything he, he was doing. And, and I was always very impressed with how he conducted meetings and, um, and really embraced the, the um, NFU. 
Um, he's also now a co-director and owner of, of Drift with me. And um, he assists, um, we've been doing a, a, an event space since 2013, and he does assist with all the maintenance for that. Um, oh, I think we're coming too soon, David. A bit more about me. Going, it's after the bridge. Bye. I'm just going to mute Alex for a second. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I was actually a teacher in a former life, and I came out of that in 2012 um, when we adopted our two children. Um, and I spent um, a good uh, year or so with, with them and decided not to go back into teaching but instead um, develop uh, an events business. And so I became a sole trader in a business that we called Castleton Events, um, which is a green acre site um, uh, that we just put marquees on and we got every single um, service involved um, and, we, and, I ran, and I effectively ran that. Um, and then um, we moved into to Drift and I became a co-director of Drift. I am now also an agritourism destination leader, um, a, a position created um, by Caroline um, as agritourism began to grow arms and legs. Um, and just within the last couple of months, I have been appointed a Scottish food and drink ambassador for East Lothian. So I wear lots of different hats, um, but um, a lot of that has come about because of the story that I'm about to tell you. So a little bit about where we are. We are on Castleton Farm, which is just outside North Berwick. You can see from some of these images, we've got some incredible views, um, namely the Bass Rock, uh, looming large in the fourth. And we are right bang next to Tintalan Castle. Um, and the third iconic image that we have in our viewing point is, is North Berwick Law. Um, so we are uh, a cereals farm. Um, we farm 430 acres. Um, we grow wheat, winter wheat for largely for gin and vodka. Although this year um, it went, it made the grade for biscuits. So Stuart was high fiving that. Um, we also grow spring barley for malting and winter beans. Um, which hilariously Stuart um, got mixed up between falafels and tortillas uh, because he said that all of his beans went for falafels. And I said, no, I don't think you mean that. I think they get ground into flour for tortillas, which, which is um, anyway, funny coming from a farmer. Um, my two children um, now, they're, they're beginning to grow up. Um, Amy is 11 and Tommy is 10. Um, and they are, or can be um, a great help around the farm and they certainly are beginning to embrace the whole family business. Um, we also, you can see there, we um, we grow some sunflowers and we have also growing part of the agri-environmental scheme. And so we grow um, some green manure uh, as part of that. Um, so I actually skipped over a picture, but there was a picture back one, um, which, which I'll come back to because it, it, it'll come it will come up um, again, but our road to drift wasn't easy. It was incredibly challenging. Um, and I think if anything as part of, of, of my presentation, I would say is never give up. If, if there's a dream that you've got um, and you really want to see that to the end, then then never give up because it you can make it happen. Um, and we did. So we went through three ideas before we arrived at the one for Drift. Our first one, um, we were going to call the Speckled Hen. And I can't actually really remember the, the reasons, but oh, yes, I can. So we were looking to, to convert a disused chicken shed. And I think we wanted to have a name referencing around that shed. Um, so you can see it in the first picture here. It's quite a big building. The idea was to have a farm shop on the ground floor and then upstairs have a cafe. Um, and because I was teaching at the time, um, I was also quite keen in involving some form of educational aspect to, to, our, to our business as well. Um, I, I felt I, I was working at, in Gorebridge Primary School in Midlothian and um, a lot of the children had no idea where their food came from. And I felt 
then that it was really important um, to have that element to it. Um, but we, we ditched the idea in the end because the cost of it was going to be far more than we felt we could cope with. Um, we also questioned the location. Um, it's bang in the middle. So these, these buildings here are farmsteading buildings. And this is a road that would, would come in from the main road, but it, it would have come right the way through the farmsteading. And we slightly questioned whether or not that was a sensible idea at the time. We also um, began a, a whole farm review with a facilitator called Matthew Curry. And um, he, he also was, was really pushing us away from this idea because of its, uh, of its cost. And he noticed that we also had another two disused chicken sheds. My father-in-law back in the 70s um, went big time into chickens and had over 2,000 at one stage. And then salmonella outbreak hit and that came the, to the end of the, the chicken story. But um, we have these chicken sheds. Now these are directly on the main road. And so we wondered if this would be a better location. We felt we already had two buildings there that effectively we could use. And we went as far as getting an SRDP grant and planning permission. Um, you, you can kind of see, again, um, we were utilising both of them. We had a massive store going on, a, a staff room, obviously our loos. There was a bit of an educational element to it. There was the cafe and the serving hatch in the kitchen, etc. cetera. Um, but two things happened in 2012 to change our minds. Um, one of them was our children um, came along and... Um, adopting two children is challenging enough without having to start a whole new business. But um, a financial impact was that we hit um, a huge inheritance tax issue. Um, and we just felt that this was not going to work. It wasn't, it wasn't going to happen. Um, there was just too much at stake and we didn't feel that we could run the risk. We also... Uh, looked at the lo its location and we said, you know what, the one problem with this is that we have no view. And we're, as you can see from the slides before, we're in this amazing location with this, these fabulous sea views and we really felt it was um, important to, to make use of that. So onto the third idea, which I've called the shell, because that was the idea behind it, was it was to look a bit like a shell. And it told a story. So you would walk in through the front door and you would curve your way around through a farm shop into a cafe, which then had views out across the Firth of Forth to the Bass Rock. Um, we actually very quickly knocked this idea on the head. As much as I loved it, again, it was in the wrong location. This was going to be positioned opposite where the chicken sheds were. So it had a bit more of a view, but it was right next to our farm cottages. And again, access was needed through part of the farmsteading. So where do you go from here? Um, oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. It hasn't, hasn't saved, um, saved my dates here, but this should say 2014 and this should say... 2016. Um, so um, I'm just going to run back through a bit of a timeline to sort of help, um, I suppose, get to grips with, with, with it all. So we started our diversification ideas back in 2007, um, knocked the first one on the head around about 2011, and then picked up the Firth of Forth ladder, which was in those two chicken sheds in about 2012. Um, Obviously, that got knocked on the head. Around about 2014, we were determined not to give up. So we're hoping you're getting this idea that we just were not going to give up. Um, and we, we started to explore the shell concept. Concept. Now, our other issue here was that my in-laws were so set against us doing any form of diversification whatsoever. And I remember having a very um, uh, sort of uh, intense conversation with my mother-in-law that basically told her that the farm was not going to continue to make us enough money and if we wanted to make more money then we had to diversify but she wasn't for it it was too much of a risk my father-in-law was the same far too much of a risk what on earth are we doing you're wasting money that, 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 that. but we still were undeterred and we were going to continue with it 
So what do we take from each of these ideas? Well, we said um, they're too big. They're in the wrong location. We need to think about our own skill sets and what we're able to do. Um, and we need to go smaller. We need to go off and away from the farmsteading. And we need to be situated on a part of our farm with the most amazing view available to our customers. So one day we were sitting in a beach hut that we own down in Canty Bay, which is the bay round the corner from this one. And I said, I asked Stuart, what, what, remind me, what's behind the sea buckthorn at the top of the hill? And he said, well, it's just grassland. It's not doing anything. And I said, and there's a brilliant view of coral sands there too, isn't there? And he said, yes, there is. So I said, right, come on then, let's go and have a look. So we got the kids togged up in waterproofs. We went on a bear hunt. We managed to get through the swishy, swashy grass. And we stood on the edge of, edge of the cliff. And we had this view here of the Bass Rock, the Fife coastline. We walked slightly closer to the edge and we had a view of coral sands. We turned around and we said, wait a minute, we've got access because we had a farm gate, a disused farm gate at the top um, behind us. We had a main road that was um, uh, had, had cars continuously on it. We knew we were around about two miles from North Berwick, the main town, about the same from the local train station. A local bus passed us um, daily on a regular occur occurrence. And we just said, here, here, that this would make the most amazing spot. We're away from the farmsteading. We've got, we've got access to um, public transport, but that view, that view is our USP and that's what we've been driving for and aiming for. And we also felt that we might get a little bit more support from Stuart's mum and dad. Um, sadly, that wasn't necessarily the case, but again, undeterred, we, we carried on. Um, for the next two years, I think I stood on that cliff um, uh, every other day um, and um, staking, staking things out um, because the next thing was, well, what building do we put there? Um, because we don't really want to break the surface. And we were down in Bristol and um, we passed a shipping container selling tea. And Stuart, of course, thought his, his, his light bulb moment went off and we said he, he went in and spoke to them and he came out and came home and started to research shipping containers and the use of shipping containers and converting them into buildings. And um, I thought, this is a dark and dream moment. What on earth is he thinking? But actually, as he began to research a bit more, I began to see the uh, potential in, in this idea. So we began to create a vision for ourselves because as something that it's something that I've discovered um, partly through uh, my Scottish Food and Drink Ambassadorship is your vision should always be your end, your end point. Where, where do you want to finally arrive at? And we needed that. If we were going to get this off the ground, we needed that end point. And I was quite proud, actually, having done that training of the vision that, that I, I came up with. Um, so we wanted to build a visitor destination of excellence in the heart of East Lothian. But most of all, we wanted to focus on fresh, seasonal Scottish produce. We've got so much of it around. We're farmers. We were mad not to put that within our vision. Um, I'm, a, I'm a good baker, even if, you know, I might say that myself. But, um, but that, that was the other thing. We, we knew we needed to start small. Um, and coffee and cake became our starting point. Um, all other ideas too big, menus too big. We, we certainly weren't going to handle these, but I knew I could go in, I could bake. I knew I could manage staff based on my experiences as a teacher. Um, and, and so we wanted traditional cakes and we wanted um, brilliant flavour, um, but most of all, sitting within the agritourism sector as well. And of course, people were at the heart of our business, so they had to appear in our vision. So we did exactly that. We went down the road of having that simple coffee and cake idea. Um, we 
and we eventually opened our doors in June 2018, having had some major planning issues, which ended up going to the planning committee, and all nine councillors that day voted in favour of our business. Now, um, to say that the planners looked like they'd been slapped with the fish and shoved in a freezer was something else. They they were absolutely sick because they really didn't believe that this that this would go through. But the, the councillors thankfully saw its potential and said, no, this will be of huge economic um, benefit to the county. And so therefore, um, we have to let this go ahead. Now, we had 80,000 visitors in our first year. If that is not helping um, bring visitors to the county, then I don't know what is. And a lot of those visitors weren't just local, they were from Glasgow, they were they they come from Newcastle. In fact, one person on social media the other day said, um, it's a shame drifts so far away. And another person said, Why? You know, drifts great. You you make the effort and you 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 get in your car and you make the journey. And she said, You're absolutely right. I don't know if I've seen her yet, but um, but but she suddenly realized that perhaps it wasn't so far to come after all, which I think anyway, up to you. Um the other thing is that um Throughout this, we've always employed local staff as well. We started with seven, having been advised to only employ three, um, which I looked at it, my husband looked at it, and we just said, there's no way we can run this just on three staff with me. That It's just not going to work. So we employed seven. Um, and within two weeks, I'd employed another person um, as well, um, just because the sheer number of visitors we had was it was incredible. So our traditional cake, we our, our carrot cake and our chocolate Guinness, they've become our firm favourites. Um, and and then obviously um, I had to had to find a gluten free recipe, and so Graham's family dairy came up trumps with a, an almond uh, an almond tray bake. Um, but the the work to get here was was. Um, was challenging in itself. Um, I'd never, I'd never, I've worked in professional kitchens, but never um, sort of run my own. Um, and so, <laughs> putting our whole kitchen together and working that, and, and you know, getting the staff on board and getting our till system set up, it was, um, it was all incredibly challenging. But again, I was, I wasn't being put off. Um, and then, through our journey, we have developed our menu. It was always something we wanted to do. If you remember back at the beginning, our vision was to, to involve more Scottish produce. And I, I always said, we'll never just do it with coffee and cake, but as we grow in confidence, we can grow our menu as well. So that's what we did. And we started with scones. And I had, I must tell you at this point, my kitchen was about 10 feet long um, by about two feet wide three feet wide maybe um, and baking 200 slices of cake a day and saying where am I going to put these in this tiny kitchen was was quite incredible but you know what we battled on and we were producing scones and we um, then decided to go into soup and um, we felt that we could prepare a soup before we did anything else in the day we could keep it warm in a kettle it was easy to serve and we got bread from a local bakery but that wasn't enough for us and Within the first six months, we expanded our kitchen, realizing that we were growing in popularity still. Um, and we there were lots of people um, wanting more um, from, from us. We also noticed that come 11, half 11, 12 o'clock, you know, our cafe could be deserted because everyone was going somewhere else for lunch. Um, and we only had that coffee and cake offering. So it did become vital for us to expand that menu. And I went and did a, a Pinterest search for, because I wanted something different. I wanted that point of difference. And so I, <laughs> I did a Pinterest search and I came up with what we now call our drift roll, which essentially is a herbioli with spinach, fresh spinach, bacon, and a fried egg. And we have people traveling from far and wide for a drift roll now, which is, you know, is quite incredible. Something you get from Pinterest and um, becomes so popular. Um, but we, we put it on our menu and it was loved. And obviously from there, some people didn't want the drift roll. They wanted a bacon roll. So we expanded into 
to bacon rolls. Um, I also wanted a, a French toast element. My children at the time, they loved French toast. Uh, and so we did a sweet French toast and a savoury French toast. And then that, that sort of morphed into um, a brioche French toast with bacon and maple syrup. Um, the other pictures you can see here are, um, this is a potato cake with um, our Herbioli black pudding from the local butcher. It's their award-winning black pudding. And then a fried egg. And that was our, our most expensive item on the menu, but the cheapest to make. So it was, and it flew out the door too. So it, it was it was really good because all of a sudden our profits were on the increase and interest was on the increase and our cafe was buzzing, absolutely buzzing. Um, and then of course, not deterred to do that, we said, look, well, let's put something on a bit heartier. And so we chose to do um, a, a sort of a take on a Scottish breakfast, if you like. Um, and and again, you know, that 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 went down well. It wasn't the best thing on our menu, but it was still there for those people that really wanted it. One of the game changers for us, and I would say that this was one of the game changers for me as um, a, a person, um, was, was becoming the agritourism monitor farmers. Um, so um, we're, we're the second round, if you like, um, of Monta Farmers. Um, and Caroline actually asked us if we would, you know, had applied and, and were we thinking of applying and would we apply? Um, because uh, she'd been sort of looking at our business over over the past year and and she thought, you know, that, that it would have been good. So we so we did apply and we got to the last three. And we had a um, good number of people around our kitchen table get quizzing us um, on, on our business. And in 2019, um, we were selected as the East Monitor Farmers alongside the Lennoxes in the West. Um, so, yeah, the, the, whole, the whole Monitor Farm programme is facilitated by Karen, Caroline Miller, but it's run by Scottish Enterprise. Um, the strength that we've gained from peer-to-peer -peer knowledge and support has been incredible. Um, I know that Caroline on this call is, is part of the agritourism um, sector now. And um, just to know that you've got people out there um, who have either run into similar challenges or are going through similar challenges or, or have been through and come out the other side and can offer you some support or some gem of information that actually helps you with your business is so, so vital. And our little East group that we've got, because this round, um, Scottish Enterprise didn't want to just help the monitor farmers, they wanted to help other farmers within the East and the West. Um, and we've come together as a group and we met for the first time in person um, last month. And boy, was it an amazing experience um, just to get around a table, talk about our businesses. We went to visit a few of the businesses to um, and just bounce ideas off one another. But also um, it gave us perspective on where we were going with Drift. And we came away from that meeting with... Um, some some sort of eye-openers for ourselves, but also for some clarity in moving forward. Um, we've also had some amazing advice from, from a variety of experts, um, from photography, from Visit Scotland, as in what they're looking for, um, from a marketing experience. I'm currently going through um, a few meetings on social media, um, because that's a huge part of our business. Um, and um, we this year have pushed for um, benchmarking. Now, horrendously, we pushed for it and we're the last ones to submit our benchmarking. But um, our business is so big, we've actually asked for further assistance on that. Um, but the reason for that is so that we can really start to um, download our own management accounts and um, help feed financially into our business to our staff um, so that they know where we're going and I can help drive their um, support and, and backing too. Um, it also gives us amazing access and boots to government. So um, two weeks ago, we had Mary Goodgen in for coffee at Drift. Um, and I remember meeting Fergus Ewing 
for the first time um, as he launched the Monitor Farm programme. <laughs> and I was so nervous. And I don't know why I was so nervous, because, you know, he's just a human being like, like any one of us. But I suppose when you're meeting someone from government, you think that they're so far above you and, and, and that this really matters. And it does matter. Um, but at the end of the day, they are ordinary people who live ordinary lives who just so happen to be politicians working within Scottish government. But to speak to Mary was brilliant. She's so, so approachable. Um, and we had an amazing chat with her, very open, very honest. Um, she's such a massive supporter of farming and, and agritourism in particular. Um, and it was, I didn't feel nervous at all with that meeting, partly because she is so, so approachable, but um, but because I knew that he was a person that could help make a difference. And so I was going to grasp that opportunity with both hands and make sure that I did make it make a difference. Um, and so it'd be great to see her next week at the Agritourism Conference as well. Um, I think we've got a business meeting with her on the Wednesday morning. So um, th those routes to government are really quite crucial, I think, um, certainly for agritourism, but to have that confidence to do that now, for me, um, um, is, is fantastic. Um, so lockdown, so I feel like I'm kind of rushing through. If you want me to slow down at all, then, then sort of raise a hand and, and I will. Um, lockdown, the two lockdowns, the first one, actually, we found to be quite positive. We've been running at 100 miles an hour with drift. And um, I think by the end of year two of our business, we'd welcomed over 100,000 people in and, and we were growing and growing and growing and almost we were growing too fast. So lockdown one allowed us to, to really sit back and take stock of where we were within, within our business. Day one, we got on a call with a lot of other agritourism farmers um, and we remained on a call with them every single week for about the first year of, of the whole COVID pandemic. Um, and as a result of that, actually, agritourism began to grow in strength. And, and just to speak to like-minded people, be motivated by them, inspired by them, it really does give you that feeling of empowerment as well to then go back and look at your own business and see where you're going. Furlough helped massively. We were able to retain and continue to pay staff. Um, we, we had a good number of staff that have been with us for the, the two years up to that point, and we wanted to retain them. It was important to us in our business that we kept people that knew how, how we ran it, um, uh, especially when we came out of lockdown. You know, at that point, it was unknown, whatever that might be. Grant funding. Um, there's no way we would have found out about the Scottish Enterprise Pivotal Grant if we hadn't been part of um, the agritourism sector at that time and in those meetings. And it was that grant, we got a £50,000 grant, and it was that grant that helped us to convert um, a previously purchased Sinclair and Rice trailer. Just prior to um, COVID, we could have queues coming out of our door at Drift, round the corner in front of our Drift sign, leading back up towards the car park. And we, we realised that we needed some form of takeaway unit. Um, it's just that pre-COVID, we're again, we're running at 100 miles an hour. Where, where do you have the time? Um, but COVID actually allowed us the opportunity to convert that trailer. And it became key to our business. So we first opened after COVID and we kept this trailer going um, because we didn't think people would feel comfortable going inside the building. Um, but we had our trailer. It was stunning weather and, um, and it allowed us to trade and bring more people out of furlough and, and back into drift. Um, and then that continued even when we allowed, were allowed to open the building again. And quite a few people for quite some time just preferred to be outside anyway. And so had we not had that trailer, our business would have suffered massively. So thanks to Agritourism, thanks to Scottish Enterprise for awarding us that grant. And then us having the um, the the balls really to to just go ahead and, and do it um, was was fantastic. Lockdown two, that trailer became so so important because we were allowed to remain open. So where everywhere else practically around us was shut, 
um, a few businesses remained open, but you had to knock on a door or um, it, it was just awkward. Whereas for us, um, we had our trailer, we were by the sea, we could carry on trading, we could keep staff employed. Um, but we became a massive mental health boost to so, so many visitors who thanked us immensely for remaining open because it gave them a chance to get out of the four walls of their home, come to our trailer. And for those people that were living on their own, it gave them the chance to meet others, socially distanced, even in a queue, and have that feeling of being physically near, if not completely close by, to someone who was a real mental health booster for them. And then they would sit in their cars and they would wind the windows down and they'd just have their coffee on the <laughs> on the window ledge and they, or they'd have their cake in front of them and, and they just got to chat for as long as they wanted. Um, and, and it was just such a lovely sight to see. Um, we also, though, had to adapt. So as you can see in this trailer, when I took this picture, all our cakes were still as cakes. But we suddenly realised that, you know, well, we didn't realise, we were told, the, the message from government was that any takeaway service needed to be eat on the go. So we changed all our cakes into muffins. Um, that way people could carry a coffee, they could carry a muffin, and then they could walk and they could eat it whilst on the go. Um, we introduced sausage rolls. Again, something you could carry in one hand, coffee in the other, and eat on the go. A cup of soups came into play. You know, there was there was so much we had to adapt and change, change with, but but we did it because, well, you, you've got a business, you want to keep it running, that, that's, that's what you do. Um, so there we go, a quick picture of, of, of that um, adaption to, to change. These were our, our sausage rolls. They, they, they sell out most, most days. Um, and, you know, we have, to, we have to work hard to keep up making them. Um, and then we also decided, well, we, we can't just have meat, we need to have a vegetarian option. So we... We introduced this vegetarian haggis bridey, which then turned into a bridey, a vegetarian haggis sausage roll. Um, and actually, we've stopped that now because it's too labour intensive. And I've introduced a vegetarian drift roll, um, something slightly different. But again, it's um, it's easier for the staff to prepare. It's easier for the staff to deliver. And 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 actually, for vegetarians, they are bowled over because they can get something similar to the drift roll, but with a mushroom instead of bacon and with tarragon mayonnaise instead of the herbioli. Um, I'm going to touch on rural leadership because this, for me, continued my game-changing experience for me. And um, I put up <laughs> two pictures um, that we were asked to draw, one at the beginning and one at the end. And I don't know how many people have, have taken part in the rural leadership programme, but if you haven't then I would absolutely recommend um trying to jump on um not obviously not this year but but for next year if it continues to go which I really hope it does um rural leadership helped me define myself as a leader who was I how did I lead and how and, and it really helped better understand myself so at the very beginning we were asked to draw this picture um of how we saw our business and um the first thing that jumped into my mind was a, a beetle car, which is a bit funny, but but that's what jumped to my head. But you'll notice that I've got four people sitting in the in the car, and one of those is me, and the others are where my management team around me. And then I've got <laughs> this sort of foghorn going on. And this is Stuart, my husband, head of maintenance and gardens. And this is the rest of the team. Um, but you'll notice we're separated and we're separated by a trailer we're obviously still moving together but we're separated by a trailer and interestingly that's exactly how I saw my business that we were a management team and we fed information back to everybody else including Stuart which was stupid because he's one of the directors he should be an integral part and was really an integral part but maybe not enough in my head throughout the course of the programme um, I really began to see that I had to change a little bit myself and work my business and run my business in a slightly different way. And um, by the end of the programme, I definitely did that. And you'll see I've upgraded ourselves to a Rolls Royce. I felt that we were running an awful lot more smoothly, but our whole team was together in that car, um, which um, for me is a massive leap forward. And 
whilst I would say in the last three months that I've perhaps disappeared back to a little bit of this, I feel I'm moving back to this again now, partly through, um, again, my monitor farm meetings and, and, and just um, evaluating the business as a whole constantly. Um, but, but a, yeah, a brilliant experience. Um, the ups and downs don't stop, though. I decided that we needed to fully embrace that latter part of our vision of Scottish produce even more. And so during lockdown, well, coming out of lockdown two, um, I decided that um, on the back of an agritourism meeting that I would we, we would expand the kitchen and I would employ a chef. Now, I thought this was exactly the way to go. Um, and, and I mean, first impressions of what you can see on the screen, this is what this head chef produced. Now, it gives the wow factor. There's, there's no doubt about that. It embraces um, Scottish produce, but it doesn't meet our drift brand. And that's where the downs hit. And we weren't getting as much um, custom um, people were there, there were quite a few complaints about the size of portions against the cost um, but this head chef was adamant this was going to work and I began to see quite clearly from our figures this was not working so um, at a point of a second isolation period because of staff catching COVID um, this head chef had refused to get any of his vaccinations and as a result of that I had to shut the kitchen completely and I reckon we lost about 10 grand in, during that time. But we were kind of losing it a bit anyway. And, um, and so I pushed his buttons and, and he left. And actually, um, I'm quite relieved he did. He's a really, really nice guy and he's an amazing chef. I'm never going to take that away. But he refused to be able to see that what he was doing was not meeting our Drift brand. So I. Um, Raise, I, I, I offered the, the position to another chef that we had on board, and this is what Peter produced. And um, I would welcome your feedback, but for me, we have barely had a complaint about the cost of our food or what we're offering. It's warm, it's hearty. For me, the look and the feel of it, uh, before you even dive in and eat it, is far more on a drift brand level. Um, this is a, a pumpkin salad with autumn greens on a bed of uh, warm lentils um, that have got sort of a quite a, um, a fresh uh, taste, herby taste to them. Um, this is cauliflower soup with hazelnuts and our own tarragon oil, and then a, a, a charcuterie board. Um, um, so um, for me, I feel we're back on the uppers. I've got myself back into drift a bit more. I'm working with the staff. I'm, I'm injecting humour back in there, and and that a bit more drive, and um, and I just feel that um, we're, we're beginning to get back on track. I still need more staff, um, but um, but but the 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 future is positive. And what I would love to do going forward is consolidate now, um, make better use of the kitchen space that I've put in, and. Um, just grow my business, but a little bit more slowly. And uh, and that's me. And thank you for listening. That's been brilliant. Thank you, Joe. Um, I'm sure we'll have some questions now as well. Um, does anyone want to unmute themselves and ask a question? I was interested, um, Joe, with your real leadership and your excellent drawings. I think they got better as the time went on as well, I like the second one. How did you, you said in the first one that your staff and Stuart were separate to you. How did you go about linking them together so that you're all in the same vehicle? Yeah, it's an interesting, so um, through real leadership, we're asked to do various different exercises. Um, and um, I think it was through those exercises that I began to see that, um, I I needed to get Stuart more involved, and and so we began to have more weekly meetings, um, and also I, I physically got him in into that into that building. But but I was able to see so so um, 
we're all profiled at the beginning. And my profile is very much a fiery red profile. So I see an idea. I've got a creative side too. I see an idea, but I like to get to the end goal and make sure I get there, which you you will have seen throughout my presentation is what we did with Drift. But there are other profiles, there are three others. And I was able to see that I actually had a group of people that fit into those different profiles. And so um, what I did was I slowly began to work with each of those people, almost getting to know them that little bit better so that I could then really find their strengths and their weaknesses and highlight their strengths and keep working with their strengths. And as a result of that, slowly but surely, the team became together more. Um, and Stuart's very creative and he comes up with lots and lots of ideas. Um, and so it's about listening. And one of my other problems as a, as a fiery red is we don't listen enough. And, and so that was another crucial, crucial aspect of bringing the whole team together was me actually listening that little bit more. Um, and through, through those things and utilizing the different, um, uh, uh, I can't even think of the word now, um, uh, ah, <laughs> you know that way where you've lost, lost the word, but we had different, different things that we could have access to that just helped us put things together a bit more clearly. And are you in charge of all the staff management or do you have somebody that helps you with like personal development for each member of staff or do you do it all yourself? Well, I did, I did have a, up, up to two weeks ago, I did have a manager. Um, and then but she actually was the partner of my head chef that I pushed the buttons on to leave. And oh. Gemma, Gemma had been with us for um, three years. And in that time, she progressed from working for us from 11 till three each day um, to then becoming a supervisor, to then becoming a manager. And and actually, um, you know, I'm I'm sad that she's gone, but on another level, it's allowed me to get back in there again. And that's why I said I dipped back into that that trailer car um perspective because I took myself too far out of the business to do the background stuff without keeping myself with it with a foot in. And so I'm very much taking on board that management of staff again, um, and rotors and and because we had a real period of unsettlement um, within them. Um, so um, will I employ another manager? Yes, I probably will in time, but it will be with a view to keeping my feet firmly in, in at Drift too, so that they know that I'm there and they're, you know, they're not there to run away with something that, that, that isn't right. Um, I would just like to say I did the role leadership as well, and um, you brought back a lot of memories and a lot of, um, oh, right, I need to start thinking about that. But just as a, as a laugh, my picture was one of a digger. Um, and the, the day I went home after drawing that picture, I went up to the site and there sitting in the shed was the digger digging again. And it was just like, yeah, and I'm glad to see the digger is no longer in the shed. In fact, he's left the he's left the site completely. Um, but but actually, what you're saying about the what you got from the rural leadership, it's inspired me to go back and look at some of the notes and things that I did when I did it. I'd actually really quite like to do it again because I think my yeah. business has moved to a different place. I know you, they don't like you doing it twice, but I think I would probably gain even more now than I did then. It certainly helped me through that time, and I would love to. I would love to do it again. Um, I think, I don't think you're alone, Caroline. I think that even us getting to the end of the course, we said we'd love to be able to do it again in another few years, <laughs> knowing where we, where we were yeah. looking to take the business. Yeah. Um, I totally agree. And I, I would. And I don't know if anyone can take that to Scottish Enterprise, because I think there would be a big queue of us wanting to do it again. Mm. But also what you were saying about, because we have a, an events company running all the events, it's quite a difficult for me to know where I sit. Mm. And I think that's been quite a, um, a difficult thing to, to try and adjust to. Mm. But actually getting to know the team that they are and just keeping inside. So, yeah, some of the things you're saying just making me think, ooh, I mean, I can't do them right now, but... Um, I can start thinking about them when I get back home again. But yeah, I think that being on the ground and 
having your it's your business and having your feet under the table in your business is really important do you not feel yeah because so I felt in the end that um Gemma was all, almost making me disconnect and yeah. and I was running everything behind which was great but sometimes it didn't um marry up with what was going on in mm-hmm. and and that that was my issue um and then when I began to to get more involved with that I, that was another reason why she left in the end because she couldn't handle that in the end I think I'd almost given her too much free reign mm-hmm. um, and and that's why I'm saying if I got another manager in I mean I could quite easily run it off a couple of I, I've got some incredible I've got two incredible supervisors at the moment and and I could easily leave it uh, you know with them and and just manage it myself but there is that bit where even now I'm working three full days at the moment and, and then if there's if I've got staff shortages, I'm jumping in. But it, it's getting that balance between being there, being able to do the things you need to do behind the scenes, but 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 being connected enough that the behind the scenes marries up with what's going on in front of house and 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 making sure that your your brand and your business are going in the direction that you really want them to go because it can very easily go a bit skew with. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think for us it, it is challenging because the events company do do everything. Um, yeah. and, and that's really what we wanted. But at the same time, it's our business and our place and our home and our, da, 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 and yeah. our um, liability um so it's yeah it's it's finding that right level and for every business it would be different but absolutely yeah, yeah. it's just yeah. it's just interesting listening to where you are on that yeah thanks that was, a, that was a brilliant presentation i've i've gate crashed here from borders i shouldn't even really be in the loading but but i want you to come along and hear you because uh i've been to drift and i just I just want you. Oh God, the cat's coming. I just want you to uh, hear the story, and that was amazing. And there's so many, there's so many similarities. We were monitor farmer, ordinary monitor farmers, and it's exactly the same sort of story and the support story, and the the rural the rural leadership's fantastic. Mm-hmm. I'm intrigued by your comment about your in-laws and how you got past that, or if you've got past it, and any tips for dealing with family in a business. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, no, I didn't really touch on that, and I'm like, that, that for me is almost like a whole other presentation. Um, but um, uh, yeah, because be, because it really was challenging. So actually, for me, what what happened in the end, I had to work very hard at building my relationship with them because at one point it was incredibly rocky, um, because I am that fiery red character, you know, and I, I bash on, you know, and who 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 cares? Um, but um, opening drift was was a game changer with them because they could suddenly see that we were so capable they could see all the people coming they could see um so sort of, you know the cash register if you like tinging and um and and they were so proud and so impressed by what we'd managed to do that um uh, it actually is what led on so we had this sort of fight of moving into the farmhouse and we're last christmas but um, you know, we 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 made it, <laughs> um, and and succession certainly is you know definitely um, working its way in the right direction now, um, so so for me that the game changer was starting up drift and making it work, and um, for them to see that we were making it work, and the other thing we did was we were very um, particular on making drift um, uh, um, a limited company and Stuart and I were the only directors so n- nobody else within the farm farming business was a director it was just us and um, because we wanted something for us um, as well and a legacy for our children and we felt that you know the only way to to really take ownership of that was to do it was to set the business up in that way so so that that's what we did it's, it's so difficult to give to give tips because as you say every single situation is very very different and um, but I think proving your self worth and proving um, that you are, you know, so capable of of doing it and and having that motivation and that empowerment just to go on and do it, you know, no matter what is being said in the background, you just put up a wall and just say, "I'm I'm going to do it and I'm going to show you," and that's what we did. 
That's great. Thanks, Joe. Is there any other questions? I just also say, you know, your bravery and tenacity. Well done. Um, and I know only too well that you need both to get anywhere if you're diversifying because it's, it's pretty hard work. You shouldn't <laughs> say that. Pretty ghastly road sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, but, 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 but it, if you dressed up all the time, then you wouldn't be you wouldn't be telling anyone the reality, would you? Mm. And it's, so it's important to to talk about those hurdles and those challenges because it's those hurdles and challenges that make you stronger and make you realize that you you know you can do it and actually when Tiffany asked me to do this presentation I'm not going to lie I was at a really low point mm. and so when she said can you come on and talk about you know inspiring and motivating women I was like mm. because at that moment in time I did not feel inspired and I did not feel motivated I felt so so down um, because I was having real staffing issues and 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 I just didn't feel drift was running in the way I wanted it to run and and you know it took took a, a huge um, um, work from deep within me to pull myself up out of that and actually the the two days away that we had with the East Group in the, within the Montefiore program that is what helped pull me back out of the fire and and put me on the straight and narrow and feeling more positive. Um, which is why if, if people aren't members of agritourism, then jump on the bandwagon and I'll tell you how to do it. <laughs> because because just if you're diversified, because that because it, it's it's a group like that that really help. I would agree with you in that way. I was going to ask something sort of related to what you were just talking about there, Joe. You said, I think, was it 2012 that you adopted the children and then you took a year out from your teaching? Why did you decide to start a business? Because obviously with young children myself, it's exhausting and uh, not, not that teaching is easy, but would it not have been easier to go back to a job that you knew how to do and would possibly fit it in around childcare easier? Or what drove you at that point to make such a big leap of faith? Yeah. Um, so um, our daughter, our eldest, um, Amy, um, so she was just shy of two when we adopted her. And um, she came with a lot of attachment difficulties and attachment trauma. And um, prior to adopting the children, I actually dropped to part time with the view of being able to go back into part time. But there were a couple of things um, uh, in, uh, from a financial point of view. I would have spent all my salary just paying for childcare um, and fuel to get me to, to work. Um, to from a, an emotional point of view, Amy wasn't ready for me to go back. And actually what I did was I took a year off on adoption leave and then I took another sort of, sort of sabbatical year. It's a, um, I can't remember what they call it now. And I remember going back into school to have a conversation about returning because I thought, you know, after two years that this would be something that I could do. And I sat in this meeting, which I was asked to attend um, on the back of my meeting with his head teacher, being, Joe, will you just come to this meeting? And I sat in this meeting, and at the end of it, they asked me what I thought. And I said, I, I can't even tell you what the meeting was about because it bored me to tears. But I sat in it and I said, will you still be doing this in six months' time? And they said, I don't know. I said, well, if you can't answer that question, then this was a complete waste of time. You have just wasted an hour of my life that I can't get back again. And if you cannot assure me that you're going to be doing this in six months' time, then I would quit right now. And the head teacher said, boy, do I miss your honesty. And, <laughs> and, and I said, yeah, but, you, you know, it just seems ridiculous and ludicrous. And I remember just before I left, um, I knew that we had our, our meeting um, to be paired and matched with the children. And I remember seeing this blue folder and I picked it up and I said to member staff, I said, what, what is this? And it was basically all my children's names in my class and with a lot of very small boxes. And she said, oh, do you not know? And I said, well, if I knew, I wouldn't be asking you. And she said, oh, it's another assessment sheet that we've, 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 we've decided to introduce. And I said, if you think I'm doing that, you've got another thing coming. That's a complete waste of my time. And I put the folder back on the shelf. And she said, you can't do that. I said, I can, watch me. And, you know, I think for me, teaching was beginning to go in a direction where it no longer for me was about actually teaching the children. It was becoming... Um, something else that I wasn't interested in. And I actually really enjoyed being at home. I enjoyed mm -hmm. being, um, weirdly, around my husband. You know, we work well as a team. We do actually work well as a team. Um, and, um, and I thought, and I can be here for my children. Um, 
and I'm, I'm close by and I'm not going anywhere. And at that moment in time, that's what Amy needed as well. So put all of that together. And I thought, and like you at the beginning, um, you said you needed to get, you know, you're kind of looking forward to going back to work because you gave you adult company. And yeah. I felt I needed that um, as well. So that's why the events business was a good one to start. I was doing maybe three events a year, but it was enough to give me something to do to make my brain work still be able to look after the children and give them exactly what they needed because we had to do a lot of therapy um, and other um, uh, different um, sort of different things with, with Amy in particular to help um, give her back everything she'd missed in her first two years of life. Um, so it, it was enough. And then, but we still knew we wanted to diversify. And then by the time 2018 came along, we were opening Drift. You know, we were... We were six years on and the children were a bit older and we felt it was completely right. So all kind of slotted in. Yeah. So I suppose in the early days when the children were really little, you weren't doing crazy amount of work. It was all sort of the planning and figuring what, out what you were going to do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank you. I think Tiffany's frozen. Yeah, I, th I think Tiffany's frozen there. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, are you back, Tiffany? Yeah, I think she's she's just frozen. Well, um, in that case, um, Joe, I think we are uh, just about bang on time there. So I'd just like to, on behalf of Tiffany, um, just thank you, thank you very much for taking the time to come and, well. Uh, not not calm. You're sitting in the comfort of your own <laughs> home, but um, but for taking the time to to give such an honest and open account of your business, and it's it's been I'm sh I'm sure everyone here will agree, it's been very um, certainly been very motivating for myself and very inspiring just listening. Thank you. It's been yeah. no, it's been great to do, and it was really interesting putting the presentation together as well and. And just going through that journey and actually if I can give any advice, even if you're not giving a presentation, just to do that with your business um, and create that timeline and, and, and just look at exactly what you've done piece by piece um, is, is a good motivator for going forwards. Yeah, no, that's you. great, great, great advice. And just just the last uh, wee point I'll make just before uh, closing, we'll be sending um, sending uh, round, as Tiffany mentioned at the start, just sending Around some feedback form. So if you could just take a minute just to fill that out and um, you'll be entered into a prize draw to, to win some um, some baked goods from, from Dan, Dan Delicious. So uh, just just take a wee minute to fill that out. It would be most, most appreciated. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see you again at the next, the next meeting. So yeah, thank you again. <laughs>